From here, uh, from. We yeah. thought you were naming a city in France. No, no, no. But in California, you can mention West Basin. West Basin? Yeah, that's uh, where we recycle all the West Basin. I know you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Please uh, wel be welcome to our stand uh, of the EIB and the Benelux. Um, and uh, to this event. And please do have a seat um, and welcome to those joining online as well, which I believe is a fair number of you already uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, this is a really great event uh, to be able to have today. I think you don't have to spend more than a few days in this region to understand how important water is or the lack of it. Um, and the lack of water, the stress, the drought, the effect that has uh, not just on um, humans but also on business is the topic of our conversation. But in particular, as, uh, as the EIB likes to advance solutions, we're going to look at one possible solution in some detail. It's not an easy one. It has its drawbacks and it has its challenges. Desalination as uh, a solution to adaptation to climate change. The Egyptian presidency, and we're very, very happy to have the minister, Rania al mashat here with us. Thank you for joining us, Rania. You've made the, uh, the, the, the topic of adaptation central to this COP, but also uh, the theme of implementation. And in a way, in this session, we're trying to bring the two together. Um, we're going to hear in a moment from you about what Egypt is doing. Um, about this, and particularly about desalination. Uh, Vice President Viliotti um, is also going to uh, explain to us that Vice President Viliotti is the EIB Vice President in charge of Egypt and the region. And we're going to hear a bit about the challenges of desalination as a solution, what the EIB is doing. We're very happy also to have Christian Berger, who is the EU ambassador to Egypt, to talk a little bit about the perspective of the EU uh, towards this challenge. And then we, we're, we're particularly pleased to have um, two of our partners and another two joining by video um, to talk to us about the solutions to some of the challenges we're going to hear, the innovation that might actually help mitigate the concerns uh, that some might have about desalination. We have Jose Diaz Caneca, who is the CEO of, uh, of Asiona. Um, we will have by video Afshalom Felber from ID Technologies. Um, we do have as well uh, Pierre-Yves Poulicain from Viola. Uh, and uh, we also, I think from video, by video, we'll have Cyril uh, Coujaret from Suez. And um, we also very happy to welcome Jake there, Levine, who is the Chief Climate Officer of um, the Development Finance Corporation. Um, so thanks all of you for joining us. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Um, Vice President Viliotti, may I ask you to uh, help us set the scene a little bit um, as regards the challenge that we're looking at and, and perhaps a little bit about where the EIB stands on this challenge. Over to you. Thank you very much, Rin. And uh, first of all, let me thank uh, all uh, the distinguished guests that we have here today, in particular, Minister al -Mashat. We are very, very much uh, happy to have uh, her with us, the ambassador of the European Union, and the partners, the partners which work with us uh, and uh, with all uh, the countries, communities uh, uh, within the region uh, for uh, these uh, important pro projects. As Srin said, uh, I'm, I'm responsible for um, some countries here in the region. And um, actually, the theme of water, I think that is one of the most relevant one. And uh, we, we believe very much, uh, and we wanted to bring the issue here at the COP27, and to talk about what we do with water, and in particular with the desalination, since we understand that this is a major, a major challenge and uh, a major criticality uh, to address uh, um, climate issue um, climate issue here in the region but worldwide we know that uh, rising temperature affect uh, health productivity and generate uh, population movements and food insecurity and in particular water scarcity 
increased by, by more frequent droughts and reduced precipitation causes desertification and fuels competition for transboundary water. This is why we are here today. We are here today because we care about the farmers, we care about the SMEs, the industries that depend on water, about the population that see water resources dramatically shrinking, including in Egypt, where the EUN forecast the country to reach the level of absolute water crisis by 2025. Several countries in the region have already started to address this issue. Gulf countries have heavily invested in desalination. Other countries are following this path, including Morocco, Egypt, Jordan, and Israel. But is desalination the silver bullet? Desalination can be indeed part of the solution. Desalination can definitely be a powerful tool to address water scarcity when developed through an integrated approach. An integrated approach which requires large investment in new desalination plants, which have to be complemented by efforts to reduce non-revenue waters and intervention to make water demand management more efficient, including with the development of water conveyors. We need water tariff to cover investment to attract private sector investor and keep the sector credit worthy and fiscally sustainable. With energy being a relevant component of the salination operating cost and therefore of the water tariff paid by water utilities and ultimately by consumers, reducing the cost of energy is a key to make the salinated water affordable. But the energy issue is not limited to this. While desalination is mainly a response to climate change as an adaptation measure, power-intensive des desalination plants require technological solutions that limit their carbon footprint not to offset their adaptation impact. These are the challenges we want to discuss today with key decision makers leading the desalination companies and development financiers. To kickstart the discussion, let me tell you how the European Investment Bank, the European Union Climate Bank, will develop water solutions and mobilize investments to address these challenges. EIB is the most active development finance institution in desalination in the region. We have invested 567 million in desalination plants, producing six 130 million cubic meters of desalinated water per year with an average of 100 million cubic meters per plant. We are supporting the development of the Gaza Central Desalination Plant, the Akaba Amman Desalination and Water Conveyor Project in Jordan. We have financed four PPP desalination plants in Israel and one in Malta. This is in addition of having funded and managed the environmental and social impact assessment for both the Red Sea, Dead Sea project and Akaba Man desalination and water conveyor project. This has given EIB a unique understanding of the impact of desalination on the marine environment of the East Mediterranean and the Red Sea. On this basis, the EIB has offered its support to the Arab Republic of Egypt for its uh, ambitious desalination program. And to conclude, let me tell you that our investment in desalination has shown significant economic value with the lowest operating cost in the region and the lowest water tariffs, technical solutions that set market benchmarks and new efficient energy solutions but also low carbon emissions and sustainable brine and chemical discharges. Yet we are not complacent and are looking for technological innovation that further reduce the salination plant's carbon footprint and renewable energy alternatives that reduce the overall cost of water.
And with this, I conclude my intervention and thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President. You mentioned the need for innovative solutions, and we're going to be hearing about some of those in a moment. But let me ask uh, Minister for International Cooperation, Rania al Mashat, uh, again, to reflect a little bit on the extent to which, Minister, you think uh, that desalination is an important tool in uh, tackling uh, adaptation to climate change, regional instability. And tell us a little bit as well about uh, what Egypt is doing in terms of its plan. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And let me start by thanking uh, Vice President uh, Vigilante for your support on many uh, projects and uh, leading the way on uh, creating examples for other countries. And I want to recognize, of course, uh, ambassador from the EU and all the partners. Today is Adaptation Day. And uh, when we talk about adaptation, as was uh, pointed out, uh, it's uh, food, water, and everything that has to do uh, with pushing uh, uh, on uh, uh, creating livelihoods for people. I think on, uh, on desalination particularly, uh, what is quite significant about it, there has been a debate that uh, adaptation uh, is not getting enough financing as mitigation particularly from the private sector. So in water desalination projects, we're creating a business case uh, for private companies. And I think this adds a tremendous uh, support to the adaptation agenda. So uh, if we want to, uh, and I want to also uh, recognize the EIB as head of the MDB group this year, uh, it was a very important year for uh, uh, climate action. Uh, the COP being from Africa, uh, pronounces and pushes forward the agenda on adaptation. Uh, desalination, uh, Shireen, when you, when you ask, um, uh, it does uh, create uh, additional opportunities, but it does require the technology. And that's where the business case is. It's also, um, uh, in the case of Egypt, when we desal water, we are going to be, the government is going to be the, uh, the customer of the private sector. So through technologies, you're able to bring down the cost of the desalinated water, and that's why uh, this partnership uh, between uh, the, the private sector, the financing, if it's concessional finance, and then the technology so that we can actually uh, reduce uh, costs as well uh, is a very important uh, uh, triangle. Uh, as of Egypt, uh, we have several uh, uh, projects with EIB uh, and uh, uh, with many of, of the partners, uh, but on particularly uh, water desalination, we're trying to create a replication of what we've done on Bimban. In 2014, Egypt changed its feed-in tariff to include the private sector in the renewable uh, energy mix. What we're doing now is we also uh, opened up uh, to the private sector on water desalination. So we are trying to, uh, through consortiums with the private sector, ensure that we are able to produce a good amount of water through desalinate water. Uh, and um, uh, create, as I mentioned, this opportunity for private sector engagement in a very important, uh, in a very important, um, uh, I want to say futuristic uh, uh, angle, because uh, if we do it right, you are able to open opportunities also for, uh, for agriculture. So this is, uh, this is the power of partnerships. It's the government putting the policy. Uh, it's the financing and the, the, the institutions with their experience. Uh, and it's the private sector coming in and taking risk, but uh, uh, through the institutions trying to reduce the risk uh, as, much, uh, as much as possible. Uh, so this is uh, also uh, Egypt. We, we created the Egypt country platform for the nexus of water, food, and energy. Uh, there's an energy project that produces renewable energy that is supposed to go and help uh, power the, desal, uh, the water desal uh, project. So this nexus of water, food, and energy is extremely important because they are interconnected. Uh, so this is, uh, this is on the national level, and the nexus of water, food, and energy uh, is pronounced nuefi in Arabic, and that means fulfilling pledges. Uh, and here is where we're saying that if there is a vision from uh, uh, the government, if there's clarity in terms of the projects and credibility with all of you, we will be able to push uh, together for implementation, which is, a very, uh, which is the uh, focus of this COP. So uh, let's nuefi together. Uh, on uh, the platform and on, on, uh, on many other projects. And here I just again want to thank EIB for the role they play and the EU for the role they play. Uh, if we create successful examples here, we can scale them to other countries and we have uh, a, a list of very successful projects that we have been doing together. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Minister. Um, in a moment, I'll turn to the Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador Berger, if you can hold on one sec. I know you and the Minister are a bit tight for time, but I, I thought it would be nice to bring in a couple of our partners as we are talking about these solutions. And I might uh, just turn to Violia's Sustainable Development Director, Pierre-Yves Poulquin. Pierre-Yves, uh, can you just briefly give us, we'll come back for more discussion uh, later, but give us a sense of how you think um, we can actually um, tackle some of the challenges that we're hearing here in terms of um, the, the desalination uh, technology in the context of the adaptation challenge and the energy challenge. Thank you. Um, just to remind that Veolia, we are the, the leader on desalination worldwide uh, with more than 20 million uh, cubic meters every day. Uh, it's a long history through our partnership uh, engineering company like CDEM uh, or WTS in the US. We have a uh, round of technology coming from small island to very big facility in, uh, in Saudi or in Oman. Uh, I would just make maybe one comment that's adaptation. Okay, this addition is one part of the answer, but like mentioned by the minister, for example, we were talking with Ashona about reuse. Treating the wastewater and using it after that, uh, let's look at what we did in Jordan, uh, Asamra. Uh, we are providing 70% 70, 70 of the water for agricultural needs of all Jordan, thanks to the water treatment plant. So I think we need, and, and, and this, it is the most effic efficiency on energy because it's about six times less than uh, desalination. So I would say that we have a range of solutions. And of course, with uh, the government, with the, the citizens, we need to define at each place what is the most suitable solution we need to implement. And we have the, a complete range of solutions. So to answer your question of innovation around desalination, I would say that just look at the price, how the price has been moving in the Middle East from the last five, 10 years. It diminished by 50% uh, on the last four years. And the last big uh, tender in Saudi just show incredible price. And this is linked to innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the, the question of energy on the total cost of water is so important. And of course, all the innovation is going on this subject. So uh, now we have a new challenge as we did at Sur, for example, in Oman, is that we are going to connect uh, solar panel uh, facilities with a big uh, uh, desalination plant. So it, it's, it's big technology because, of course, you, you understand that uh, a plant needs to run 24 hours a day and a solar panel is not completely high. But when you know that in Sur, you have about 30% with Total Energy and Veolia building the solar panel plant, uh, we are bringing 30% of the energy. Uh, we, we are part of the solution as well. So I think on one side, the, the, there will be more efficiency, less consumption of energy. On the other side, we will have to innovate on how we put uh, uh, renewable energy as uh, a key, uh, a, a key uh, sources of energy. Yes. It's, it's technology as well. And step by step, everything is going to change. So uh, I think in the Middle East, of course, it's part of the, of the game because uh, renewable energy is everywhere. Egypt has started a big program as well. So I think we have, we have the different part, and there will be as well the adaptation of the change of the quality of water. Yes. It, it's a new frontier, but when we talk about adaptation, yes, the water will change. And we all know when you're talking about desalination that you're taking water from the sea with more salt, or in Egypt, it's one of the challenges in some way places. Uh, so more salt means more difficulties to treat the desalination water. Uh, the temperature of the water is an issue as well. So everything is going to be adapted, but of course that's a big challenge that we are ready to endorse. Thank you very much. I, I'd like to come back to you later to expand a bit more on this, but very, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Jose Diaz uh, Caneja, can I ask you from Aciona's point of view, I think um, we mentioned the word cost at some point there. Uh, let, let's talk about that. I mean, w when we talk about cost, we talk about affordable as well, right? For, for people, actually, that's important. Can desalination deliver adaptation through viable investments and, and competitive water prices, do you think? Mm -hmm. Again, a brief answer. We'll come back uh, to okay. expand a little more in a moment. No, I will, I'll be brief. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation of being here and the possibility of being here, Minister, Mr. President, Ambassador, and my colleagues. 
So, um, price and, and emissions. So, we'd like to briefly talk about a couple of things. And as period, my colleagues said, uh, over the last 15 years, the, the improvement of the technology has been uh, absolutely radical. Desalination has been the main water source in, in, in many Middle Eastern countries, and specifically in the GCC countries, apart from Saudi Arabia. Rest of them, we can talk about the UAE, Qatar, Oman, half of it, and Kuwait, and Bahrain, of course, are fully dependent on, on desalination. They have no other source of fresh water. So to me, that's, that's a, a, a no-brainer on, on, on the idea of desalination being absolutely an adaptation or the adaptation tool for, for, for sustainability in the region. On top of what Pierre Yves said about uh, reuse, and that there are several factors that we will need to elaborate on that. But concentrated on diesel, in, from the 60s to probably the mid of the 2000s, uh, we have seen a, 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 let's say, little evolution in the technology, mainly delivered by thermal technologies that were very intensive in energy. Over the last uh, 15 years, and let's put uh, 100 as emissions in the year 2000, moving from thermal technologies to reverse osmosis, we have uh, divided the consumption and the emissions by two, so 50%. Then the improvement on the reverse os osmosis technology itself, let's say it has added another 10% of improvement. And now, coupling to renewable energies, and this is only in the emission sites, and, but, which is what we are talking about, it also cut probably about 40% on the, on the emissions. So we're talking that 15 years ago we were in an emission level of 100 and we are now in 25. This reduction of 75% of the emissions in desalination over the last 15 years is absolutely dramatic. See how long have been, or we have been talking about uh, sustainability and emissions reduction is quite much more time of the 15 years I've been talking about and and, and and this will improve of course this is asymptotic and cannot be at the same rhythm same pace as it is as it has been up to now but definitely there is still a way to walk probably on the, the, the most or uh, the biggest part of it coming from coupling not only PV but also wind power that could make that 40% additional efficiency in not emitting CO2 on the energy, uh, 60, 70, 80% of it. We will need always a plug to have the, 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 the thin plug to the network and the system, but definitely I see that in 10 years' time, the consumption would be probably, from the network, will be probably in the range of 20%. Thank you very much for that projection. I'll come to Jake in a moment for a perspective on the, on the financiers. But before we do, I want to turn to the ambassador, Christian Berger. Um, Christian, you've heard a little bit about uh, the challenges, uh, some of the solutions, and also from the minister uh, about what Egypt is doing and her perspective um, for the region. What about the view of the European Union? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation here to, um, to the pavilion of our bank. The European, um, the European Investment Bank is, um, is certainly the bank of the European Union and is becoming an environmental bank. So thank, thanks for, 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 for that opportunity, Minister. Um, great uh, being here with you and Vice President and, and colleagues. Um, now, let me come with three challenges, perhaps. Uh, but before doing this, since the Minister talked about it already, congratulations on the, the Nexus event that we had the other day, where you signed many, uh, many agreements on the Nexus of water, food, and energy. And as you said, this is a very important uh, contribution to the adaptation aspect. Uh, now, the three challenges. Let me start with the scary one. Uh, the scary one is that the UN estimates that for every one degree of global warming, 7% of the world's population will be exposed to a Greece in water resources by 20%. Further, they estimate that by 2030, water demand will exceed water supply by 40% if the use of water continues under a business as usual scenario. So, and it's even worse here where we are in the Mediterranean region. So climate change profoundly affects the Mediterranean region, which is among the world's world's most water scarce regions. 
and the region warms 20% faster than the rest of the world. Freshwater availability is set to decrease by 15% and within 20 years more than 250 million people in the Mediterranean will be classified as water poor if we don't do anything. Therefore, the, um, the Cairo high-level agenda on water finance and investment for climate resilience, which was launched at the Cairo Water Week in 2022 uh, and supported by the EU uh, here in Egypt in partnership with the Union for the Mediterranean, the Egyptian Ministry for Water Resources and by the Global Water Partnership addresses that challenge in an integrated way. So one challenge is the situation, the other challenge is to find the necessary finances to uh, address that situation. So the Cairo agenda calls for governments to adopt a strategic approach uh, to enable the water-related sectors to contribute effectively and efficiently to the climate emergency and to develop a portfolio of, uh, of climate smart water projects. So in this regard, the EU has developed various tools to address the finance aspects with grants leveraging loans and guarantees from financial institutions such as the EIB, the EBRD, but also the member states' banks to support innovative water sector programs. Now at the project level, desalination plants are highly capital intensive. I know this from first experience, I was involved in, um, in the water desalination plant in the Gaza Strip, which is a huge, massive, inter, uh, exercise of more than half a billion euros uh, has taken a long time uh, so it is indeed a very high high capital in intensive uh, enterprise and as such public private partnerships green finance and blended blended finance can help to bridge the critical financing gap yet we have to ensure that these desalination projects are sustainable and green and are respected and respecting the rules of integrated water resource management. So desalination option should be the last solution or the only feasible one based on a water or drought management plan that includes climate change scenarios. And here, as we have just heard about the, the issue about energy for desalination, I just want to refer to a very interesting project that we have supported here in Egypt at the, at the research center in, in Bosch al Arab, where salt is being liquefied during the day and is being used during the night to fuel the desalination uh, at that research center. So there's a lot of uh, interesting technology out there that I think we should uh, look into and make available uh, as wide as, uh, as possible. So we must find, um, we, so we must put our efforts in circular economy approach to address the challenge around the implementation of the water energy nexus and here recycling cleaning water work on uses energy uh, co-generation and many of these aspects that we've been discussing many of these pavilions here i think are highly important thank you very much thank you very much ambassador before i i go to before i go to jake i wonder if i could ask you minister um just to just to reflect a little bit on a couple of the points, uh, particularly the ambassador made. I mean, to what extent do you feel that the challenges of um, desalination are an obstacle to delivering on the very ambitious plans that, for example, you have in Egypt? Or do you feel it's, it's, it's in a sense, the scale of the challenge is such that we really have to sort of press on with it? Well, let me uh, focus uh, uh, on a few points that were made. Uh, water management, uh, waste management was mentioned. Uh, Egypt has uh, many uh, water waste management plants uh, that were uh, done in coordination with many of our development partners. We have one of the biggest ones globally in Bahr al Ba'ar. Was uh, uh, you know, uh, and the technology that's used there is quite impressive. Also. Uh, uh, with El uh, Gabal al-Asfar and many others. So we, we, when we say water desalination, we're not excluding uh, the, uh, the water waste management plants, and you're absolutely right, uh, they're relatively cheaper. And that's why uh, uh, when, when you say uh, what's the challenge, I think it's the opportunity. We cannot uh, uh, ignore water desalination. We want to start doing it in the most efficient way and then scale it. So testing. Uh, how can we open it up to the private sector? Have the private sector do the bid and have the technical advisory through the IFC or EBRD or the EIB so that there is that um, 
uh, shared knowledge uh, that uh, comes from abroad. Uh, the, other, the other important aspect is uh, water is a public good. So one of the key uh, um, concerns for any government is how are you going to price uh, what people have been taken for granted for so long. Uh, and here comes uh, the idea of how much of the water that's going to be provided to the public will be desalinated so that you, will, you have a weighted average of the cost of the meter of water. So these are, these are very practical uh, uh, questions. And the answer is always with the financing. Financing when it comes to uh, concessional financing, when it comes to structuring uh, uh, and, uh, and also scale. So I think, I think for Egypt, uh, we're very happy that we're starting this now. Uh, we could not go without it. Uh, uh, there is a commitment uh, when it comes to opening up uh, to private sector engagement. We have a lot of credibility and leverage with our international partners. Uh, and they know how to work with each other. So what's very unique about Egypt, given the scale, is that on one project you can have uh, Europe, uh, US, uh, uh, Japan, many others working together on the same project. So this in itself uh, creates uh, the power of partnership that we look for uh, in order to very quickly move ahead and accelerate the agenda. So I'm just, uh, um, uh, I think I, we're all very encouraged with the enormous energy that's here at COP27. Uh, despite the very gloomy global backdrop, everybody's uh, discussing, trying to find solutions, uh, and I'm sure that together we'll be able to uh, address whatever challenge the government has, the private sector has, uh, the international community when it comes to the financing, uh, and we're in this together, together for implementation. It's not that the agenda ends on uh, November 19th, but at least we, we are energized to continue what needs to be done together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Jake, I think I'm going to bring you in here. The minister mentioned uh, the important role of financing and of partnership. So from your point of view, um, how do you see the role of the development uh, financiers here? Thank, thank you, Shireen. Um, and thank you to Vice President Viliotti and to the EIB. Um, it's really wonderful to join you all. And I just also want to thank the minister for her tireless work to make this such a success for implementation. We are going to be leaving this COP with several dozens of real leads in business to ramp up and scale up and deploy in Egypt and in Africa and in the region. So this is a really important meeting. And I also I just want to note, because the brilliance of Nawefi and the nexus of water, food, and energy from our perspective is that it really does create a model for bringing the policy and the regulatory certainty that the business community needs to bear on the broader picture of what's happening. So often DFC uh, confronts opportunities and is in high demand for financing but the developer of the project can't even get going because they're not sure what the policy environment looks like. They're not sure what the enabling environment looks like. It makes it difficult to determine pricing, to determine land use, to determine uh, basics like permitting and, and, and licensing. So for us, the power of Nuefi and as a model for what we could be doing um, around the world is enormous. Um, so I wanted to talk about a a different project, actually, it maybe as a little bit of a model for the, the desal. Can I come back to yes. you on that one, unless I, I'm aware that ministers... Okay. okay. Sorry to be rude, Jake, but I'm, I'm under instructions. Um, I want to let the minister go, and then we're going to continue the conversation. The ambassador, um, I'm not sure, ambassador, if you're okay to stay for a few minutes. Okay, I'll leave it with you. All right. Sorry to interrupt you. Keep going. That's okay. I think you have the moderator's prerogative and the minister's prerogative. Um, we, w m my uh, CEO was here a couple days ago and had the opportunity to sign a, late, a letter of retainer for one of the f first of its kind green hydrogen project in Egypt. We're working with the Norwegian developer Skatec uh, and the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Egypt, and importantly, uh, an off-taker called FertiGlobe, and an Egyptian engineering construction firm called Eroscom. And this is a massive industrial project that requires a lot of capital, and it requires a lot of renewable energy. It's very analogous to what's happening in D-Cell. 
DFI comes into the picture in partnership with other MDBs, including EBRD, to provide the flexible, really concessional financing that you need in order to develop this kind of a first of its kind project to help bring pricing down. And the types of strategies that we can deploy uh, and that we're eager to work with our friends at Veolia and Axiona on in the desal space is, is long-term, long-tenor financing that is not available from the commercial banks, um, flexible pricing that can meet the needs of the private sector in terms of the timing of an offtake, in terms of the timing uh, of construction. Um, and then really importantly, one of the new tools that DFC has at its disposal, which we were authorized to use in the legislation that created DFC a couple of years ago, is technical assistance funding, where we can pair project preparation dollars uh, in the form of uh, repayable loans, or in some cases, pure grants, uh, to help develop a project from uh, its beginning stages into a bankable stage of development. And that type of blending to bring these different structures together is really critical to getting these massive projects off the ground. We're now looking at how we can support several of the NUEFI uh, desal projects uh, in partnership with AFDB in particular. We're looking at projects in Morocco and in Jordan um, uh, that I know that um, uh, our friends here are also eager to, to support. Um, and I think that there's a, a huge opportunity. I just want to end with one note, which is DFC had its record year in FY22 for climate finance. We did $2.3 billion of climate-linked finance. And of that, $390 million was purely in the adaptation and resilience space. But for anybody that's familiar with the cost of a major desalination project, you know that with the $390 million, we didn't finance a desal plant. So a goal that we have for the coming year is to multiply that number to get adaptation into the picture through desalination and really scale on the adaptation side of our financing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. I may come back to the Vice President in a minute uh, for some comments uh, uh, just to add to that perspective. But first, I wonder if we maybe now can hear from a couple more of our partners, but they've uh, offered us a video contribution. Um, we're going to hear from um, ID... Um, uh, let's see who it is that we're talking to. Yeah, um, we're going to hear from Afshalom Felber, who is the executive chairman of IDE Technologies, and we're going to hear about a sort of reflection on what we've been talking about a little bit already, which is how we lower the carbon footprint of this technology. IDE Technologies, a world leader in desalination and water treatment, is proud to have been a partner to the EIB for the last two decades in three of the largest desalination plants in the world uh, in Israel. These plants have shown IDE's obligation and commitment for a minimum environmental impact of the water supply on the environmental around us. We have shown this capability both in reducing our energy consumption since the first plant to the last plant by almost 30% per cubic meter We've shown this commitment by implementing these plants as much as we can without arming the surrounding areas and doing pipe jacking into the sea of uh, our pipes instead of cut and cover. And we've shown this commitment by reducing the chemical consumption of these plants much further than any previous plants known in the world. ID is pro-green, but uses minimum chemicals in its pre-treatment and post-treatment areas is already a brand that shown very efficient use of the chemicals in the desalination process. We also move to the next phase, uh, looking forward to the future, trying to do maximum production of the necessary chemicals on site by sea mining, actually taking those seawater that we are desalinating and taking out of them chemicals that are used further in the desalination process. For example, the IT power plant in the latest SOREC plant under construction now together with the AB is capturing 100% of the CO2 emissions of this power plant and taking them back into the desalination process as a chemical necessary in the process of desalination thus reducing the carbon footprint of the plant and making it much more economical and efficient. Our expectation is for 
clients of the future, like governments and semi-government bodies like the AB, to put the demand on lower environmental impact as part of the various demands in the tenders they are issuing. To date, ID does this only on an economical basis, but the more that those entities will push towards higher demands on environmental impact, the more the industry will follow and be able to come with innovative solutions. Last but not least, ID sees the future of desalination as a full ecosystem that allows it to mine from the sea some of the chemicals as well as necessary elements for energy production, such as green hydrogen that will be part of future desalination plants and other chemicals like chlorine that can be manufactured through the desalination process and be used on site without the necessary elements of delivering and the carbon footprint that comes uh, with them. So, um before we go to Suez, I maybe, maybe I'll come back to you, uh, Pierre-Yves, uh, if I may, you know, with the, with, touching back on the, the energy solution here. I mean, I guess, you know, we, we're talking quite granular in granular terms here, but for environmentalists and even within, you know, perhaps the EU, we heard a little bit from the ambassador earlier talking about desalination should be the last resort. Um, do you think there's a kind of job of convincing to be done here? Uh, th there's certainly some reservations about this as a, as a tool to tackling adaptation. Maybe I'll, I'll throw that to you as well, Jose, afterwards. Well, as I mentioned, desalination is part of a, a list of solutions. Yeah. Uh, I think we should, of course, make advocacy for the people, the citizens, to understand how the the technology has changed the progress. Axona mentioned some of it, IDE mentioned some of them. I, I could mention as well uh, in Sur, in Oman, that we are working on the pretreatment, which is a very energy part of the process, to use the sand filter on beach wells. So it's a new technology where you use the nature to filter the water on the pretreatment part. And this is almost without energy. So. There is a lot, a lot of new technology, new innovation, uh, because as I mentioned at the end, uh, price will be the, the, the key driver for everyone. Environmental, it's something we all share. If we are in this business, we do care about environmental issue. That's it. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, innovation will come. Uh, we are talking about, uh, for example, we, we launched at Veolia a barrel. It's about two meters to 10 meters, where you have everything inside. Uh, reverse osmosis installation for 5,000 cube meter a day. It's, it's completely in a kit. It's very fast. You save the footprint, which is one of the issues on the environmental as well. Uh, so, I mean, there is a lot of innovation everywhere. So I think people must understand that they cannot compare about the thermal plants they have been seeing 20 years ago. It's nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. Uh, and, uh, and they are very happy to have water on the other side. And as mentioned by the, the minister and the vice president, is water demand is something key as well in the Middle East. We need to explain to the people that water is precious and uh, we need to change the way they consume the water as well, as we do in Europe. Uh, but sometimes you have in the Middle East a uh, high level of consumption, which is higher from what we have in Europe, where the water is, is, is really scarcity. So I think we need, uh, we need to take all the, the chain from the citizens, the consumer, to, of course, we have our role to play, the government, the financial institution, everyone, it's a collective transformation in a way. But in the Middle East, in, in Spain, uh, in, in France, it's coming, uh, this question of desalination will be there because it's part of the solution as well. Thank you. Maybe, Vice President, do you want to come back on that? I mean, obviously, the, the solution, in a way, as for energy, is not just about creating new uh, innovations, but also tackling the issue of consumption as well, more broadly. Um, thank you very much. Um, um, I am an economist by training, uh, and uh, so I would uh, look at uh, the issue in terms of uh, optimization of what uh, we have to do. We have a scarce resource, uh, and uh, we have uh, several elements to put together, which is uh, the environmental impact, uh, which is the technology which is required, uh, which is the regulation which is required, uh, and the capital. So we have to put all these elements together 
And I would, I would like to add also a fifth element, which is, uh, you know, the, the risking element, what the international community and development institution can do, because we know that, uh, you know, immense capital, I mean, an important uh, um, amount of capital is uh, required within uh, uh, these projects, and uh, we know that the uh, private sector to be involved, they need uh, a business plan, they need to see what are the revenue, we need the regulation because, uh, as, uh, as it was said, you know, it, it's an issue also in Europe. I come from Italy. In Italy as well, there is an issue to price water. Water is a pub public good, but it's uh, generated. It has a cost to be uh, bared. And in this regard, you know, we need also regulation, which can uh, ensure that uh, the water is uh, water projects are financed, and that are the remunerated that people is aware of what they, they consume and that uh, there, is a, you know, there is a clear link about uh, you know, the productive nature of this, uh, of this investment. And in this regard also, you know, technology, it's, uh, and technology and environmental impact, they go hand in hand. Because uh, what we know is that uh, we need to develop a, a solution, technological solution, which, uh, can, which can reduce the footprint because uh, actually I agree with those who say that, uh, you know, we will need the salination plants maybe also in Europe very soon. And uh, it's, it's a powerful instrument, but uh, we have to ensure that, uh, you know, through this adaptation mechanism, we will be also able to limit uh, uh, the, footprint, the footprint. We believe that there is a scope to go ahead and in this sense, I think that uh, we are there to provide uh, concessional financing, to provide the risking to this project and to attract private investors. Our role is that to be a catalyzer of, uh, of business. And uh, this is the way in which we are approaching a um, big project like the Akabana Amman uh, uh, desalination and conveyor in Jordan where we know that uh, you know, it's, uh, the, the public resources are not sufficient uh, you know, for, uh, for, for driving such a type of project, and where also you know, the, the private sector to be part of uh, the solution required to, to have uh, you know, some revenue stream uh, to, 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 to be repaid. And in this regard, as a, as a financial uh, international organization, like other uh, development uh, actors, we are there to provide our technical and financial advice and also policy advice so that all the actors could work together to optimize, uh, to optimize the, the process and to, to find uh, you know, the optimal or the, you know, the, the proxy to optimal solution. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President. Um, I'd like to come to Jose and Jake in a moment. Let me just uh, ask our colleagues to play our second video from um, Suez. Uh, this is from Cyril uh, Kujare, who's the CEO for International Business. And again, um, talking about this issue that we're touching on a lot now, how we make uh, desalination environmentally sustainable through improved water quality, lower carbon emissions, and sustainable chemicals and brine discharge. Desalination is an effective and proven answer to the risk of drinking water scarcity. However, desalination is an energy-intensive process that emits greenhouse gases and generates brines. So, how to make desalination environmentally sustainable? Suez expertise in reverse osmosis desalination process allows us to produce drinking water from salt water in an increasingly ecological and sustainable manner. How? By achieving energy savings within the treatment process itself through the implementation of state-of-the-art technologies, for example on the pretreatment, then by providing desalination plants with renewable energy such as solar farms, concentrated solar power or wind turbines ensuring a low carbon supply to the plants. For instance, in Melbourne, Australia, Suez operates the largest reverse osmosis desalination plant in the southern hemisphere, producing 450,000 cubic 
meter per day. 100% of the energy consumed by the plant comes from two wind farms installed nearby. The plant has a green roof surrounded by a 225 hectare ecological reserve, creating a biosphere for local flora. In terms of water quality, the reverse osmosis technology provides high quality water as the membranes retain impurities, bacteria, and even viruses. Today, the brines are safely released into the ocean through diffusion structures. The ocean currents dilute the concentrated water within seconds. In addition, we develop research and innovation projects to reduce the soil content of the water discharge and also to reuse the content of the brine for other purposes. For example, magnesium can be used by the pharmaceutical and automotive industries. But management of water resources must go through a global reflection, including optimization of the distribution network, optimization of the consumer consumption, and the development of the reuse of treated wastewater. Therefore, as shown, desalination is part of the global solution, and Suez provides the technologies and know-how to make it as sustainable as possible. So that was from Suez. Um, I don't know if there are any questions from the floor, either from uh, colleagues who maybe aren't entirely uh, convinced or, or those who want to add some points. But let's come back then um, to Jose and, and Jake to reflect a little bit on uh, what we've been hearing. Jake, over to you. Yeah, no, on the, on the environmental side of the of the desalination technology on top of uh, just for ending and closing the thing on the energy side there are two main two main issues traditionally one is the energy consumption this is this a, it's a say that to me is is, is quite of a, 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 a well traditional disclaimer i do not agree very much with that no it's intensive in energy consumption well intensive is a very vague word intensive depending on what if you don't have water probably it's not so intensive, three kilowatt per hour per cubic meter, per, per thousand liters. So I, I, I would measure what we say about that. But just to close in the thing on the energy business, we have said that, that there is a big reduction over the last 15 years in energy consumption, and probably related to the emissions and the environmental aspect, coupling PV with salts, with wind power, and also, if our friend Elon Musk is not very busy with Twitter, the batteries will also play a, a, a big role here. So probably in the next decade, we will see a lot of, a lot of uh, improvement in a almost, uh, not total, but almost total coupling to renewable energy. That's one thing. Second is the brand discharge. Brand discharge has always been a topic, again. And I would say that, that we should target this aspect from a technical point of view. It is very easy to talk uh, again vaguely about the brine and brine coming back to the sea here, there. Well, technically, and there are, I mean, you name it, don't know how many number of studies in which at uh, just one meter outside of very big desalination plant the discharge points, there is not affection at all, at all, to the, to the, to the Living, living, living stock that is surrounding those. So, so of course, there are some type of elements, some type of uh, vegetables, uh, Posidonia oceanica and others, that are sensitive to salinity. And, and the thing is designing the, 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 the outfalls in the way that they could match this sensitivity of uh, several animal or, or, or vegetable life to this salinity. On top of that, and we have, we have done that in, in Australia, in Adelaide, which uh, are not, let's say, reputed for not being environmentally conscious, on, on, on videos, submerged videos, all type of analysis during long periods on the evolution of the marine life in the outfalls of the desalination plants, and, and it's publicly and ready available. There has been no real, no real impact at all. Just the other way. 
probably in some occasions it would improve even the, the, the percentage and, and volume of, of living stock just surrounding this industry. And just as, as, as a final comment, because I didn't answer in, the, in, the, in, in my first intervention to the, to the price, <clears throat> and we also should be a little bit cautious on that. Up to one year ago, and in the very largest scale diesel plants in the, in the Middle East, in the, specifically in GCC, in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, we were achieving uh, a target level in the most competitive uh, tendering processes, ranging around in the level of 40 cents of USD per cubic meter. Unfortunately, um, from what we have seen over the last year in terms of price escalations, commodity escalations, energy escalations, we are not anymore in that, uh, in that uh, benchmark. Now we are in the 60 cents. I mean, the last couple of big, large scale tenders, the winners were in the range of 50 to 60. And in these last ones, it's more, much more closer to, to 60. Is that a big problem? I, I don't know. It depends for what are you going to use the water, which is the need of water again, and uh, let's say 1,000 liters for 60 cents of USD, to me, does not mean depending for what. Agriculture is a totally different thing and depending on the crops that you are growing. But for industrial purposes, for municipal purposes, I mean, most of you or some of you are paying more than one dollar for one liter. And we are talking about 60 cents for a thousand liters. So I would like to put things in the right context when we talk about these type of things. There's a lot of demagogy on that. That's very interesting. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, Jake, what do you make of what you've heard? And I, I want to pick up also on a point um, which may be more of general interest, perhaps a little less technical than some of the conversations um, we're having as well, which is that, I mean, uh, the VP was uh, reflecting on the idea that, you know, this is not a technology that is going to be uh, limited to this region. Uh, we are and we are already seeing, um, you know, the need uh, emerging and certainly the effects of climate change in her own country, Italy, but of course in parts of the states where you come from. Um, it's interesting to me that this could be a technology which is unlike many of the others, what, floating wind farms or, you know, where, which have been kind of uh, started in Europe or, or in the states, scaled up. It could be the reverse here in a way that the, this is the beginning of something that will really have an application worldwide. Hopefully not too much if, if this COP achieves what it's meant to, but unfortunately it's inevitable to some extent. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, uh, California, which is also dealing with real challenges in terms of climate impacts, drought, uh, wildfire. We have our own very fraught story as it relates to desalination. Um, you know, this is a some of the discussion that's been elicited today in terms of what are our policy standards on environmental impact? What are the structures around which we think about pricing? Those are very much at play in California, which we know is maybe one of the leading jurisdictions on earth when it comes to climate policy and regulation. So one thing that I think is important to say is in the world of business projects for climate adaptation and resilience, this stuff is hard. And the work that you all are doing to clear a pathway and create models and to pioneer this is that much more important because if it were easy, we would know how to do it. Um, I think that you're exactly right. We can, we can create these models in Egypt, in Morocco, in Jordan, in the Middle East, and that that can redound to the benefit of uh, countries around the world as well, um, including in the United States. I think, you know, the other thing that I would just say, and I'll be brief um, and, and hand it back over to you, I've just appreciated the chance to learn from this panel and observe the sophistication and the complexity and the nuance because we're going to have to operate in an area of in-betweens here and we're going to have to understand 
What are the trade-offs that we're willing to make? How are we going to recognize that, yes, water is a human right, but we also need to finance that in a way that is sustainable to scale and provide it for more people? Um, that we need to protect uh, the local environment and communities and work with the most rigorous uh, performance standards, which I know our organizations share in terms of the IFC performance standards. Um, we believe that that is a core part of what the US and the G7 are putting forward in terms of the Partnership for Global I Investment and in Infrastructure, PGII, to provide an alternative for financing that meets certain standards, uh, not just on the environmental side, but on the economic sustainability for the host countries. Um, but, you know, let's not make perfect the enemy of the good. There are so many projects that die at DFC because the environmental permitting, the compliance regime is just too complicated for the private sector to work through. And it's not like they're bad projects. And so I recognize that we all have work to do to sort of meet in the middle and understand what we can get done. And I've just, I want to say thank you to the panel for raising these important issues and, and giving us a chance to, to really see them in detail. Yeah, thank you. I think that you raise an important point. I was actually going to ask you about public acceptability and also the connection with um, social and environmental standards. Um, as you say, that's something we all sign up to. The EIB has recently um, approved new environmental social standards. And in fact, I think next week we'll be announcing its new environment framework. And of course, as you say, sometimes this can be a burden. But it, isn't it, maybe I can throw this to you, Vice President, isn't that um, you know, standard, the involvement of the community, absolutely essential um, if these projects are going to get off the ground um, and what role can the EIB working in these regions play? And let me just jump in very you briefly to say, yeah. by no means did I mean to imply the opposite. No, 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 We're, I know. I'm being provocative. I know you're being provocative, yeah. but I want to clarify. Sure. Of course, it's, it is essential. Yeah. You have to remember, the Biden administration, this is core to what we're doing. Absolutely. The, and I, I just wanted to recognize some of the complexity in that conversation, that, yeah. that it can be essential, but we can also make it work uh, exactly. more smoothly, more f quickly, exactly. more efficiently for the private sector. No, no, no. And, and I mean, I can say, I mean, the Vice President will reflect on this, that, you know, you, you have a counterproductive effect, don't you? If you impose standards that are too complicated, uh, the, 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 the goal is, is not achieved. But thanks. No, thank you very much, uh, Jack, for raising this issue, which is a, is a key issue. And uh, it's not a provocation. It's uh, actually, as you said, it's uh, just uh, the reflection of the complexity of operating in, uh, in certain environment and, uh, and trying to do things according to, to certain standards that maybe in some advanced economies are the, the, the normality, while in others not. Um, and I'm also happy that you mentioned the G7 initiative, which is uh, very close also to, to our European uh, Global Gateway, that is uh, the issue of uh, uh, promoting investment by setting standards as well. And I think that um, you know, now there could be the conditions for pushing this agenda. Because I think that in many developing countries, I think that there is a raising awareness of what are the risks uh, to be engaged in big projects, uh, in big financial you know, it's, um, commitments, which are not uh, linked to socially uh, standards or that can impinge on the, the debt sustainability of countries. I think that it is a raising awareness. I'm not sure that we are already there to, you know, to be um, able to to implement projects according to our standards, but I'm pretty sure that uh, you know, there is a, a strong international impetus uh, uh, to ensure also to avoid a certain type of competition by some uh, global actors which do not apply these standards. And then in the end, uh, you know, they provided investment that uh, not necessarily are good. So I think, and uh, you know, financial sustainable and also socially sustainable. 
sorry if I am a little bit uh, you know, cryptic, but I think that everyone is, uh, is understanding what I'm referring to. Uh, but this is to say that uh, I, I believe that uh, <coughs> if we can bring uh, in, uh, into developing countries uh, projects which are technically good, uh, which are financially good, uh, and which are accompanied by uh, standards and uh, policies and uh, also aid to the governments to implement these standards, it's a challenge that it's worthy to, to cope with. You know, this is a very rosy picture. I understand what are the complexity, but uh, in the end, it's, a, it's an agenda on which our politi poli politician masters are engaged in, and uh, that I believe that uh, financial institutions like us uh, can, uh, can do a lot to, to implement, and I'm pretty sure that also the private sector, it's, uh, I think that it's eager to work within an environment where there is a a stable um, regulatory system. I think that it's uh, much better for also private investors to work within t this type of environment. Thank you, um, yes, Amina, for that. Um, I think we'll draw uh, to a close in a moment, but maybe also our competition from <laughs> the, the panels around us is, is getting quite intense. But I, I think um, uh, just maybe I can turn to each of you uh, one by one to help us sort of wrap up a little bit in terms of responding to some of the points that have been made. And I guess also just to pick up on um, uh, what the Vice President was saying just then, um, I think uh, about the role also of the public institutions um, in bringing not just finance actually, but standards as we're saying, but also as you said earlier, um, technical assistance uh, along the way. Uh, to get the projects off the ground. And I guess that is something that is also, um, you know, attractive to private investors as well. Not just attractive, but hugely important. Um, maybe, Jose, I'll turn to you and then, and then back to you, Eve, and, and finally to Jay. Yeah, well, I think that, that the, the aim, the willingness is there from, from all the parties. I mean, the... We, as, as, as the private uh, developers, technicals, we are, of course, more than excited about the potential of the technology and what has been done and achieved over the last decade. Having said that, I, I, I would like to highlight and what Jake said about the, moving from the Middle East to the US, no? what Jake said about California and I think there is another barrier that it depends a lot on the on the location and the and the administrative regulation and the probably socio socio political environment. But I will tell you a very brief story on that. I I I've been working in this business for more than twenty years now. And one of the first weekends I need to spend working it was doing the list of the relevant desalination plants that were on the pipeline in the US. And this is at the very beginning of the 2000. Uh, and we spent a whole weekend working on that list. If you take a look at the pipeline of opportunities in the US today, the list is exactly the same with two exceptions. One is the project that we refurbished that has been a disaster. So we, we refurbish it and we are operating it currently. That is Tampa Bay Water Diesel Plant. And the other, it's uh, the one in uh, Carlsbad, the one in California that has been developed by IDE. For example, we have been working with Kiwi and Poseidon since 2016, and we have been named preferred bidders in 2017 for Huntington Beach. Two months ago, Huntington Beach has been cancelled. The Coastal Commission denies the permits. So all this after 20 years of planning and more than six years of working being preferred be there on that. So there is something strange there. And, 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 and that's, we talk about environmental things, we talk about economical things, we talk about but the regulation are not purely related to environmental, even if it is, let's say, uh, frame as probably environmental, but I do not think that it's totally on that. It's also a big barrier 
that at least we need to think about that. And I don't want to, maybe it's just a comment that, that I think it's important that we all, that we all share on this, you know, that there are many factors, some of them probably uh, psychological, political. Yes, way. exactly, exactly. Thank you so much. Um, Eve, I mean, how, I, I guess, reflecting a bit on what you're hearing, but also more generally coming back to the idea of this panel today, uh, which is to, to talk about um, where the uh, desalination solution is going to be as one of the toolbox solutions to adaptation. Um, how optimistic are you um, and, and, and how big do you think the challenges are? Well, the challenge for us is to remain competitive. Going to uh, be? To be competitive. Uh, and uh, as mentioned by Jose, uh, the price will continue to decrease. It's part of the game. And that's what you're using the private sector for. And I would just to re want to rebound on, on, on the vice president's words. I think we need to have you on board because for us, it's part of the selection of the project we are going to follow. Because behind, you were mentioning the social environmental safeguard, of course, it's part of our DNA, it's in link with our purpose. So Veolia, it's very important to have actors like you because we, we know that the framework will be well defined. We hope that the end that the competitor will be choose based on that. And I think that's your role as well to be very clear that, okay, you take action at IDE, US, Veolia, but you can exclude other one as well, uh, especially on the EPC side, where sometimes in this region we see uh, uh, a big EPC company coming from outside of the world. And that's why your role is very important because we do believe the framework you put in place are key. And it's nothing, it's really linked with our value and uh, DNA. So we are very pleased with that. And then we need you to, to make sure that the competition is, is clear as well. Otherwise, we have an issue. Uh, we have an issue because we will always follow the rules and we want to make sure that uh, everyone is going to follow them. So competition is key. It's a, a big driver for innovation. Uh, the market is in front of us, unfortunately, I would say, but adaptation uh, is in front of us as well. This addition is one of the uh, key solutions. So there will be new markets. There will be new innovation coming back, unfortunately, to mid and sea and, and up north. So, uh, yes, we will continue to work because at the end, because of the competition, we will have to diminish our price. And we know that energy is key uh, in, the, in, in the cost sheet. So we will continue to work on that. And uh, we have been giving a lot of examples during the panel. So thanks for that. Thank you very much, Even finally to, uh, to you, Jake. I guess the good news um, uh, from, from here, and, and I think you were saying it as well, is that from the financing point of view, um, the Development Finance Corporation is among many who see this as a genuine opportunity, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, we, absolutely. I mean, I don't have that much more detail because this is at the core of what we're focused on. And it's not just desalination, it's, it's major infrastructure and the kind of financing that you need at scale to bear on the mitigation adaptation demands that we have in front of us. Desalination is a big part of that. Um,